Hi, chemistry students. Today we're going to do some gas laws activities. I'm going to go around the room and try a bunch of different lab activities and show you the activity. And then I'm going to give you the opportunity to pause the video and write down some information. And then at the end of that, I will come back onto the video and explain the phenomenon that we see in each of these activities. Now, I asked you to gather up some materials at home. If you have any of the same materials at home, you can try these activities on your own. Definitely talk to your parents first, make sure you have their permission. Um, you could potentially injure yourself with burns or broken glass or things like that. It's unlikely, but it's possible. So I do want you to make sure that you be careful if you're gonna do any of the labs. <clears throat> some of these are fun little tricks that you can try. So I'm going to uh, go ahead and grab the camera and we'll get started here. I'm going to come over here for the first one. And my materials for this are pretty simple. I have a, a large syringe. You probably don't have one this large in your house. This is for veterinary use for like putting warmer down a horse's mouth or something like that. <clears throat> but any syringe will work. So I'm going to try to compress different types of material. So the first type of material I'm going to try to compress is some solids. I've got these little fossil rocks. I'm going to stick them down in there. And I'm going to see how compressible solids are. Now you can probably guess that rocks are not going to compress very much. And I can compress the rubber on the stopper here a little bit, but I cannot really compress a solid. Probably not a shock. Next, we're going to try a liquid. So I'm going to get just a small amount of liquid, doesn't really matter how much, and I'm going to put my finger over the syringe and I'm going to try to compress it. And you can see it might compress a little but not very much, and I do have an air bubble in there too that I probably should try to get out first. That's better. <clears throat> so again, liquids are not very compressible. Get rid of that water. So solids can't be compressed, liquids can't be compressed. And now we'll try a gas. So I've got air in there and I'm going to compress the air and it is quite compressible. So <clears throat> solids can't compress, liquids can't compress because their particles are very close together gases, on the other hand, are compressible. Okay, so from that lab activity, you should have learned that solids cannot be compressed because their particles are very close together. Liquids, same thing. Now, the particles in a liquid can move past each other pretty easily, but they can't really be compressed any closer together because they're already very close. And in a gas, the particles are really far apart, and therefore you can compress them together. Now, when you compress a gas, you end up increasing its pressure inside. Pressure in a gas comes from the particles bumping into the walls of the container and bumping into each other and creating a force that pushes outward over a particular area. So force divided by area is the definition of pressure. So we'll talk about pressure next. So in this little lab, I've got a little piece of wood, and I have three objects that I'm going to try to push into the piece of wood. Now I think you can probably stop and make a hypothesis on what's going to happen with each of these just by looking at them. I'll zoom in a little bit closer here. So I have this pin, push pin here, with a really tiny tip, it's sort of been bent, but it's still a small tip, and when I push it into the wood, 
I'm pushing pretty hard, but I am able to get it to go into the wood. It's kind of sticking it up. And if I had stuck it in one of these holes, it might have gone in further. Here I've got a nail that's got maybe a larger tip than the pin. I'm trying not to put it in one of the holes, but I'm trying to stick it down in there. And it's, it's pretty hard to get it to go down. And I'm using my left hand. I suppose if I used my right, I might have better luck. Let's see if I can go in one of these little holes. Mm, not really. And then I have this rivet. And it's got a really wide tip. And of course, as you would expect, I can't push it in to the piece of wood. So the question then is, what does that have to do with force and area and pressure? So pause the video now and think about that and write down what you think that has to do with force, area, and pressure. And then when you unpause, I'll explain. Okay, so uh, pressure is force divided by area. So I'm using about the same amount of force each time I push down. I'm giving it the same force. But because the surface area of the tip of each of these is different, the pressure is different. So a smaller surface area makes larger pressure with the same amount of force. So with the force that I'm capable of generating, I can get a large amount of pressure there. But here, it's a small amount of pressure because that force is spread out over a much larger surface area. And of course, the nail is somewhere in between. Okay, here's another one that you probably can't try at home. You might have a rubber balloon at home, but you probably don't have a nice balance like I've got. So for this activity, we're going to see what we can learn about air. And I've got my balloon and I've got this clamp that I'm going to use to hold the balloon shut. So when I put those on the balance, I record my mass as 17.9 grams. And now I'm going to add air. Now, you could blow it up with your mouth, I suppose, but because of COVID, we're not doing that. And of course, we have these fancy air jets here at the school, so I'm going to use that. It's a little easier anyway. Let's close the lid so you can see. That's probably enough. That was really loud. And if I twist this around and put my clamp on, we're going to weigh this again and see what we get. Make sure the whole thing's on there. And we got 18.0. So the mass actually went up, and the reason for that is because the air inside the balloon has mass. It's made of particles. It's made of mostly nitrogen and some oxygen and some other particles. And those particles all have mass. So, um, so pause your video and write a little bit down about uh, what happened with the balloon and what we learned from that. Okay, the next lab we're going to do is another one that is uh, probably not something that you can try at home. Unless you have one of these. These are sold as toys sometimes. Uh, this one is called a hand boiler. Sometimes you'll see them called a love meter because it measures whether or not you're in love, I guess. I don't think that's true, but... <clears throat> so, here we have a container. It's made of glass. There's a pocket of air here, a liquid at the bottom, a straw that goes down in, and then you got the coiled straw, oops, and it goes to the top, and there's a pocket of air at the top as well. So we're going to look at the relationship between two variables um, on 
a gas. And remember, it's the gas that we're concerned with here, not the liquid. The liquid will do something interesting. But the gas, which you can't even see because it's clear, that's what you need to think about. So this is a little bit tricky to think about that. So um, we're going to look at how temperature affects the gas in this container. So right now it's sitting on the table. The table is at room temperature, which is, you know, 70 degrees or so Fahrenheit. And my body temperature is hopefully warmer than that. So I'm going to put my hand on it here. And you should start to see the liquid going up the tube. And it goes around the spiral. And up to the top. And sometimes if you're warm enough, I'm a little bit chilly today, you'll get, there we go, you'll get bubbles and it looks like it's boiling. It's not actually boiling, but it looks like that. So, for this one, let's see if I can get it to bubble again, there we go. So for this one, to understand what's really going on, you got to think about how the particles in the container are moving. And I'm going to let it cool back off a bit, and we'll watch it see what it does as it starts to cool. It's still pushing some gas bubbles up the spiral, and then once they hit this curve, there they go. <clears throat> And before I ask you to think about what exactly is going on, a couple other things I should show you. Well, let's go ahead and watch, see what it's doing right now. It's changing for sure. So you should notice that the liquid has come all the way down now. And if I put my hand on the bulb at the top, that liquid goes down fast and I get bubbles at the bottom. And I'm just barely touching it enough to warm it up. The other thing you might be interested to look at is what happens if you hold it upside down. And right now, I had all the liquid in this bulb, and I still have all the liquid in this bulb. It's not moving to the other end. But if I get all the liquid to go mostly into the top bulb, good enough, and then turn it over, you'll notice even though I'm holding this one and keeping it warm down here, that liquid's not rising up in. So pause the video, take a minute, and think about what is changing. Obviously I changed the temperature, but what is changing as a result of that change in temperature? And you might think in terms of the gas laws. We talked about Charles' law, Boyle's law, Gay-Lussac's law, um, Avogadro's law. Maybe you've seen Dalton's law, I think, at this point. So think about each of those laws and see what you think. Pause the video, write down a little bit about this one. Okay, so let me give you the explanation for this one. Let's give it all back to the start. So when I first took this out of the container, it was room temperature. The whole thing was at 70 degrees or so. And the bottom bulb has a gas in it. And when I warmed up the gas, the particles started moving faster. So knowing that particles are moving faster in a warmer gas, that's really, really important. Go back down. Thank you. So these gas particles started moving faster. Now, the liquid is being controlled by two pockets of gas. There's gas up here that's pushing on the gas all the way down and pushing on the surface of the liquid in the straw. So in the straw, we have gas particles bouncing around all directions, but bouncing and pushing down on the top of the liquid. Gas particles down here are doing the same thing. They're bouncing around and pushing on the surface of the liquid. So this liquid will move depending on the balance of pressure in those two gases. How hard are they pushing? How often are they bouncing off of it? So if the temperature here is higher than here, then this gas particles are moving faster 
and bouncing around more often and hitting the surface of the liquid more and pushing the liquid up the tube. Whereas the gas here is moving slower and it's still bouncing around and hitting the top of the liquid and trying to force it down, um, but it's hitting with less force and less pressure. So lower pressure here, higher pressure here means the liquid gets forced up into the top. So let's watch that happen. There it goes. And once it runs out of liquid, it'll start pushing gas from here up to the top. And it looks like it's boiling. Like I said, it's not really warm enough to be boiling. There we go. <clears throat> so now, when we let it cool, this gas will cool and start putting less pressure on the surface of the liquid. This gas is going to stay at about the same temperature as it was before, and it, eventually this gas's pressure will become equal to this gas's pressure, and they'll both be pushing at the same amount, and gravity will be able to take over and bring the liquid back down. All right. This one is one of my favorites. It's possible that you've seen one of these toys before. Um, I just pulled it out of the box. Of course, it's wrapped in some nice bubble wrap. And when it first comes out of the box, uh, you can see that it looks very, very much like that hand boiler that we were just looking at. So we've got a liquid in the bottom, and there's a gas above the liquid. There's a straw down in the bottom, very much like the hand boiler. And then there's a straw, the straw goes all the way up to the top, and there appears to be a glass sphere up here, and then the bird's got some cloth on it. So this is called a drinking bird, and so I'll show you what happens. First of all, you should notice that it's kind of able to wobble, but that's all it can do at this point. And notice that the liquid is all at the base. Maybe you can see that. Let's see if we can move closer. Hopefully that's focusing on it here. Liquid's all at the base. So to make this thing work, we're going to have to get it wet. And this is a really absorbent cloth. You can kind of see the liquid is absorbing all over and onto the cloth. And so now I'm going to set it up like this. And you might see a change. Let's do it sideways here. So you might notice the liquid is starting to come up and fill the neck of the bird. It's slowing its wobble down a little bit. a drink. And it made a thunk. It hit the glass, so I'm going to back it up from the beaker just a bit. Okay, let's watch it a little more and see what happens. The wobble is slowing. Oh, it's taking a drink again. Probably stuck on the glass. Oh, no, there it goes. Oh. <laughs> Trying not to break it. These are pretty fragile things. And here it goes again. And you can't see this, I guess, but I can tell you that if I left this here, it would stay all day and do the same thing. As long as I continued to have water in the beaker. So, pause for a minute and see if you can write down what's changing. What variables are we adjusting here? How are we changing each variable? And what are the results? And it's very similar again to the hand boiler. So pause and write down some stuff. Come, wake up. 
Oop, there we go. I'm going to adjust it a bit. But while I take it out, I'll show you the results or the answer. So, this container is exactly like the hand boiler. It's built just the same. So the gas here is putting pressure on the surface of the liquid, which will push it up. There was a gas in here. Oh, there's gas in there now. Let's see if I can warm this up a bit. The gas in the top is pushing down on the liquid, and the relationship between those two pressures is what causes the behavior of the bird. And that gas is not going to want to go down, is it? There we go. The liquid, I mean. So now I got the liquid back down. Well, maybe. So, um, so the same thing is going on here. There's a temperature change, but the temperature change in this one is not caused by my hand. It's actually caused by the water that the bird is drinking. It's not really drinking, of course. And so when the bird dips its nose into the water, the water covers that cloth, which is covering the glass sphere, which has gas in it. And as the water evaporates off the cloth, you know, just like when you get out of the swimming pool and it's totally fine and you're warm during the day, and when, but once your body's wet and you get out of the pool, you feel very cold, right? Much colder, if, especially if it's windy, you notice that you feel colder. And the reason for that coldness is because the water is evaporating off of you. So here we have the bird, the water evaporating off of its head, making the gas inside cooler than the gas down here, which is at room temperature. So the uh, liquid is going, getting pushed by the higher temperature, higher pressure gas down here, up toward the lower temperature, lower pressure gas up here. And when the bird tips over, the liquid runs back down in, making the bottom end of it heavier, and it makes it stand back up. And then um, the gas pressure was also equalized at that point. So now we have high pressure here, lower pressure here, and the liquid moves as a result. So, cooler temperature means lower pressure for a gas. All right, I'm gonna let them dry out. If you have one of these toys, if you leave it going for too long, the cloth will come off and then it doesn't work anymore. Okay, for our next video, we're going to blow some bubbles. I just got it all over my face when they popped. Um, so get your bubble wand out and your bubbles if you've got some at home. Hopefully you are able to round some up. Or you could make some of your own with some dish soap if you've got that. And blow some bubbles. And think about... Oops, they're being difficult. Think about the gas that's inside the bubbles. Let's see if I can catch one. Nope. Oh, I almost got that one. There we go. You might notice that the bubbles always come off the wand. Maybe not quite exactly round, but as soon as they get freely floating, they end up perfectly spherical. So think about the behavior of gases and pause the video and write down why that is, why they're perfectly spherical. And if you want, you can try something fun. You can try to get some twist ties or something like that. Or if you can get those um, chenille wire pipe cleaner things like you use for craft projects in elementary school and make a shape that isn't round, then usually these bubble wands are round, right? So make one that isn't round and see if you can create a bubble that's pyramid shaped or a cube. See if you can make one that's freely floating in the air. I always tell my students in person that I'll give them extra credit if I see, if they make it and I can see it, they can't just say that it happened, uh, a freely floating cubic shaped bubble. I'll give them extra credit. Of course, it's impossible. So the reason for that, well, pause the video, think about it for a minute. I'm gonna blow some bubbles and then I'll tell you.
you might even notice, I'm not sure if you can see in the video, but when they land, not only are the bubbles spherical, but when they land, the bubble prints are perfect little circles, except where I made drips. Had to put some goggles here to protect my camera from the bubble solution. So, what is the reason that the bubbles are perfectly spherical? Well, the answer is that inside the bubble, you have gas particles that are bouncing around. They bounce off of each other, and they bounce into the bubble solution. The bubble solution has high surface tension, so it likes to stick together. And um, as the bubbles, or as the gas particles are bumping into the bubble solution, they're pushing out. Air pressure, of course, in the room outside of the bubble, that air is pushing in. And in order for those to be pushing in, in a way that balances, you know, they kind of balance each other, um, all the particles are moving around and pushing out at about the same force each. So each gas particle inside the bubble is pushing out with the same force as each other particle. If you had a situation where certain particles pushed out really fast in a particular direction, you might be able to get pointy corners, but gases don't do that. So um, all the gas particles will behave about the same, especially because they're at the same temperature in the room. And so all these particles are pushing out with the same amount of force, the same amount of pressure on the outside of the bubble, and the air is pushing with the same amount in as well. And as you probably remember from biology, uh, many things in nature are spherical because things like cells, right? Um, they're spherical because that's the best surface area to volume ratio. You get the biggest volume with the least amount of surface area required. So that ends up being the shape for all kinds of things like stars and planets and bubbles. Okay, so I just tried a couple of experiments with uh, some things that I had around the room that didn't work the way I expected them to. So uh, I think it's because I have some pretty old materials. So I wanted to give you a couple of suggestions of things you can try at home. With this one in the hand boiler, we talked about how temperature affects the pressure of a gas. Well, if you have a container that's capable of expanding, that pressure will expand the volume of the container rather than building up pressure. So uh, we wanted to look at the pressure, I'm sorry, the temperature versus the volume relationship. Um, and temperature and volume, we need to think about how those relationships work. So you could try a marshmallow in the microwave, put it on for about 30 seconds and open it up and see what, what it looks like. As long as your marshmallow is not stale and dry, it should actually do something interesting. You can try marshmallow peeps. They work really well, especially if they're fairly fresh. Um, there's actually a website somewhere dedicated to uh, putting peeps in the, marsh in the microwave. Um, they they're really interesting and they're tasty that way as well. They kind of melt on the inside. Um, you can try a chunk of ivory soap um, if it's a fresh bar and you get it a little bit wet first. You can put it on, on a plate, put it in the microwave for about 30 seconds and you should see that soap start to expand because when that soap was made, they incorporated air bubbles into it, which is why ivory soap also floats. Most bars of soap don't float. Um, another thing you could try along these lines is taking a balloon and putting it in your freezer. So take a balloon, look at how big around it is, and maybe if you've got like a cloth tape measure, like for measuring, you know, for sewing and things like that. You can measure the circumference of the balloon and then put it in the freezer and you should see the circumference change. It won't change enough that it's necessarily obvious, but if you measure it, you'll definitely see a measurable change. So give those uh, lab activities a try if you get a chance and let me know what you come up with. Okay. This is a fun one that you can definitely try at home. Everybody has the supplies for this at your house, I would bet. 
And you can really impress your friends. If you got any younger siblings, they'll definitely get a kick out of this one. So I'm using an Erlenmeyer flask. You probably don't have an Erlenmeyer flask at your house, but you could use uh, any kind of glass bottle. Glass tends to work best because the top is really, really smooth. Uh, if you used a plastic bottle, though, most of the time they'll work, like a water bottle, Gatorade bottle, whatever. Uh, any of those should work. So I'm going to fill it up with some water. The amount doesn't really matter. But maybe halfway-ish. And the other thing that I need, besides maybe a paper towel occasionally, um, is a piece of cardboard. So you could cut it out of a cereal box, or this is off of a uh, note card, so any of that would work. So you got your container of water, you got your note card, and you want to get the mouth of the bottle pretty wet so that it'll make a nice seal. And then you put the card on top, and I'm hoping I'm going to videotape this where you can actually see it. Oops, let's see. Get in here. There we go. So hopefully you can see this. And we're going to just flip it upside down and make sure the card, the mouth of the bottle is completely covered. And then you can remove your finger from the card and it magically stays in place and all the water stays in place too. So pause the video for a minute and see if you can think about what changed when I turn this upside down and why the water is not coming out and why the air is staying up here. All right, I'll give you the answer and let's see if I can do it before the water comes rushing out. Eventually you saturate the card and <laughs> it comes loose. So in this case, we have actually two places where there's gas. There's gas inside the container and of course there's air in the room all around the container. When you flip this upside down, um, the air in the container actually expands. The volume of air increases and the reason for that is because water is pulling down because of gravity. The water is being pulled down, which gives this gas a little bit more room, which lowers the pressure. The particles get moved farther apart, so they hit less frequently with each other. So the pressure here is lower, and the pressure outside the room is higher. Now, for this water to come out, air has to come in and replace the water that comes out. And air is pushing up and trying to get in there, but the cart is in the way. So as soon as we move the card enough for some air to get in, air goes in and water is able to come out once that pressure gets equalized. Let's see if you can see me here. Okay, this next one's really fun, uh, but it can be quite dangerous. It is one you can try at home. You probably have the stuff to do it at home. Um, but if you do it, you got to be really careful. First thing I want you to notice here, and videotaping this is going to be tricky, I'm afraid. So I've got a, a bowl of water, or a sink full of water here. You can do a bowl or whatever. And over here, let's see if you can see it. Yeah, I have a Bunsen burner set up here. So I have a ring stand and a Bunsen burner. You don't have that at your house, but you probably do have a stove. So what I would do is use a stove instead at home. And then I have uh, a coffee can. I'm sorry, this is a Coke can, a uh, soda can of some sort. I'm going to put that on there in a minute. And when I'm done, I'm going to get it really hot and I'm going to take it off. So I'm going to use these things. These are called beaker tongs. They're rubberized and rounded and they fit real nicely on the can. If you don't have something like that, that would work that way at your house, you'd want to use a pair of really good uh, oven mitts so that you can, you know, maybe the silicone kind that are sort of rubbery so that you could grab the can and move it. Now, this is a little tricky and my video camera setup is not perfect, so I'm going to see if I can adjust it just a bit. Okay, I think I now have everything in the view that you're going to want in the view at the end. So you're going to start by putting a small amount of water into your soda can. 
And I'm going to turn on the Bunsen burner here. Of course, you would just turn on your stove and you can set the can typically directly on the stove. Again, make sure your parents are okay with you doing this. It can be a little scary. So, Bunsen burner on, there we go. That's nice and hot. Okay. And I'm gonna heat this can until it is completely, oops. Until it's completely obvious that the water inside is at a boil. When I'm done, I'm going to turn off the gas and I'm going to grab the can at the base of the can. Can you see where I'm trying to grab? Yeah, a little bit. I'm going to grab the can at the base and I'm going to put it over into the sink and flip it upside down and put the mouth of the can under the water. Now, it's hard to do this. If you've never done it before, it's tricky. Also, make sure this was an empty can before. Don't try to do this with a full can that's closed, you know? Because you don't want to heat up sealed containers because they tend to explode. So this is something that sometimes takes a few tries and it takes a little bit of guts because you got to do it fast and it's hot. And there's going to be hot liquid in it and if you do it too fast and you're not careful, sometimes you'll splash the hot liquid out and if it gets on you, it'll hurt. So, this is really not more dangerous than making macaroni and cheese, which probably you've done, but it can be a little scary and a little dangerous. So you do need to be careful. I am hearing gas bubbles in there, I think. I'm seeing a little steam come out. Let's see if you can see the top of the can at all. It's hard to see. Let's get closer. So I got steam coming out. Got fire underneath. That ring is starting to glow nice and red. It's pretty hot. Definitely don't want to get it on me. I think we're about ready here. So again, when it's time. I'm going to grab that can from the bottom, like if this was my can, I would grab down here. So at the, close to the bottom, bottom third at least. And then I'm going to submerge it so the whole mouth of the can is completely under the water. Okay, I think I'm ready to give it a shot. So, we're going to turn off the burner, grab the can, flip it upside down, all in one quick motion. If you put it in and the mouth is not completely covered, it won't implode like that. So you'd have to try it again. If it doesn't completely implode like this, you can always give it a second shot. Okay, so take a minute. And now that I put it in water, it's nice and cool. I can touch it. Still don't want to touch this stuff. It's too hot. So take a minute and discuss. Think about how, uh, what things we changed. And don't forget, The bills at lunchtime are really super long. <laughs> Don't forget that uh, there's air in the can and there's also air in the room. So that's gonna be important too. And then pause your video and think about that, write some stuff down, and then I'll come back and tell you in just a second. All right. So here's the deal with the can. So when I had the can sitting up here, it was an open system. So the air inside the can got really hot and most of the air actually left the can because the particles are moving around so fast and if some of them can uh, move out of the can, that's what they're going to do. So they left the can and there were very few particles inside the can and the particles that were inside the can were really hot. Don't forget there's air around the can, and that air is bouncing off the walls of the can pushing in, and the air inside is bouncing off the walls pushing out. And if we have equal amount of pressure on the inside and the outside, then the can doesn't change. But 
Once I flipped it upside down, I sealed the mouth of the can. So that means particles, gas particles, can't move in or out anymore. Now we had a bunch of particles that had moved out. Now they might want to move back in, but they can't because we've sealed it off with the water. So once I hit it on the water, I seal it off and the temperature drops really fast. The water just uh, will cool it down really fast. So if the temperature inside the can, the very few particles inside the can that are moving around, temperature drops, they slow down, they put very little pressure outward on the can. Of course, the air pressure inward on the can doesn't change. So now those two pressures, pushing out and pushing in, are not balanced, and the outward pressure is, is almost nothing at this point. So the outward or the inward air pressure crushed the can. It's hard to imagine, but there's 14.7 pounds per square inch. So think about a square inch of your skin. Not very much. There's 14.7 pounds on every square inch of your skin being pushed down from air pressure. Basically just because the air above us is being pulled down by gravity. And in every direction on your body, you're getting 14.7 pounds per square inch. And of course your body is pushing out, all the liquids in your body and everything are pushing outward with that same amount of force to neutralize that pressure, to equalize the pressure. Okay, for the next demonstration, I have something called a Cartesian diver. And these are not gonna be real easy to make at home. But basically what I've got here is a pipette or a dropper and I've tied some um, just wire around it. Actually, I think these are from paper clips. And to make a good Cartesian diver, let me get this out of the way, you want it to have enough air in it that the, the water in it and the metal attached to it, when you put it all in the water, it just barely floats and it wants to come back up. And right now I've got it a bit too heavy. It's got a bit too much water in it. So I'm gonna take it out and get rid of a little bit more water, a little bit more air, and it should bob down in and pop back up. And that's kind of where I'm at right now. So that is my Cartesian diver. Now what am I gonna do with it? Well, this is what they do. If you put it into a two liter bottle, and ideally you've got your two liter bottle full of water. Let's just get it a little more full. And I put my Cartesian diver in. Hopefully it goes down and comes back up. Okay, good. Sometimes they go down and stay down and that's a little frustrating. And then I put my lid on. see if I can get to a position where I can show you what this actually does. Is it showing up nice? Pretty well. Okay. So I've got my Cartesian diver. Let me get behind it so you can see. There we go. It would help if I had darker clothes on. All right, so I'm going to squeeze here, and there he goes. So he dives down to the bottom, and when I release, he comes back up. You can squeeze, and he goes down, and then he comes back up, and you can, you know, if you're careful, you can kind of hold him in one position, get him to float there for a bit. There he goes. So this is called a Cartesian diver. So take a minute and write down what you see happening. What's going on, and keep in mind this is a gases lab, so it's the gas that we're thinking about, not so much the liquid. Well, the liquid's important here too, but the gas is really the biggest concern. I'll be right back.
to see it better with some red up against. There we go. So, squeeze it. Down it goes. You can try this with things like ketchup packets or like soy sauce packets from a restaurant. Sometimes you can make a Carte Cartesian diver with them in a two liter bottle as well. So maybe give that a shot if you get a chance. That was not something I included on the list, but it could have been. Okay, so how does this thing work? What is going on here? Well, our Cartesian diver, if you remember, I wonder if I can get them out. They're very difficult to remove from the bottle. Have to, there we go. Uh, so this diver is composed of a pipette. So it's got an open tube at the bottom and then uh, a little area that can hold a lot of water or gas. So let's not worry about the two liter bottle for a minute. Let's look at the tube. So we have in here some water at the bottom and some gas at the top. And this is really only here to add weight to make it dense enough to sink. So this diver itself, the volume of the diver is the whole amount of space that this whole part takes up and this part takes up, the amount of space it takes up. And remember, density is what determines if something floats or not. The density is the mass divided by the volume. Well, the volume of the diver doesn't change, but the gas bubble up here, when you increase the pressure on this by squeezing, it increases the pressure on this gas and the volume will decrease. The water will shove up into there and decrease the volume of gas, which allows more water into the diver. Now, if there's more water in there, it has a higher mass. So, because it has a higher mass and the volume didn't change, its density goes up and so it sinks. See if we can make him do it one more time. These are really fun toys to play with. And there he goes. So his density is changing based on the pressure. And if you had him filled only with liquid and no gas, the, ga the liquid would not be compressible. And so it wouldn't change and so it wouldn't sink. So the only way a Cartesian diver can work is if it has a gas pocket in it, and that gas pocket can of course be compressed because as we know, gases are compressible.